Stand by SOT-1. Standing. 10 seconds. Ready, Roland. Ready, SOT-1. Ready. In four, three, two, one. Roll in. From legendary Uncle Studios in beautiful Southern California, welcome to another edition of Work Comp Matters, the central location for you employees, you employers, and of course, we haven't forgotten about you damn independent contractors. And now, here's this week's edition of Work Comp Matters. And it may be beautiful Southern California, but it sure as hell is friggin' hot Southern California. August uh, 19th, 12 noon straight up. Welcome everybody to another edition of Work Comp Matters. This one is gonna be good. So stick around for the next half hour. We're brought to you by theworkcompcentral.com. If you want the number one location for workers' compensation in both California and around the United States, check out theworkcompcentral.com. They've got a free seven-day offer, and if you want to pick up their services, I have them. You should too. It's only $1 a day. Work Comp Matters is also brought to you by A1 Law, number one computer management system used by more workers' compensation attorneys than any other system on the damn planet. 818 Three five seven four one two zero for your no strings attached money back guarantee. Also one dollar a day. A one long. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name's Steve Appel. I'm joined by the madman across the water, John Scalia, my chief of staff, the doctor, but he's not a medical doctor, Mike Zima. And of course, it's Wednesday Hump Day. We're joined by retired Judge Howard Goodman, thirty five years in workers' compensation, twenty years on the bench. And for today's segment of Ask the Judge, he's going to be talking about attorney fees. And um, I'm just going to, you know, we're going to go right into it. Judge Goodman, welcome and go ahead and take it away. What's up with attorney fees? Well, if you ask anybody what the most important thing in work comp is, other than the injured worker, they'll say attorney fees. Um, I'm going to be saying, let me go on record saying I've given the world's largest 5710 fee. It was in the Carol Allison case. I awarded a 5710 fee of $32,000 after the WCAB told me that I should do it on recon. But, and, uh, just, and, just, and just for clarification, of the 32,000, about 2,000 was for actual time spent during the depot, and the other 32 grand was because the insurance company appealed it all the way to the appellate court. And although you denied the 30 grand in fees, you were ordered by the appellate court to award those fees. If you just want to ex- briefly explain that, yeah, basically the Allison case is, is, is notable for it was a discovery issue. It was a pretty straightforward. I think it was like an ortho case, and the defendants were asking all kinds of questions about psych and applicant's attorney objected. Ultimately, the Court of Appeal decided that the defendants were out of line and remanded it. And applicant's attorney petitioned for 5710 fees, not only for the deposition, but for his time spent on the appellate work. Now, I initially said in my decision that I think he did a great job. I don't job, but I don't think that I have the power. And the WCAB panel said, yes, you do. So I awarded him $32,000. Actually, he initially wanted thirty-seven. dollars he, uh, he and defendants agreed to $32,000. So that, that, was, uh, that was the basis for the Allison case. But again, it was a discovery issue. But 57, which segues into 5710 fees. Labor Code Section 5710 provides for attorney fees for the, dep- for the applicant's attorney for the deposition of his client. So how do we decide what to award on 5710 fees? Um, the range goes anywhere from, I'm told, $550 to some boards in the Inland Empire down to $300 in some of the other boards. Um, what do I look at? Are you a certified specialist? If you're a certified specialist, I'm going to give you, you know, probably at least four or 450 an hour. Again, I'm doing ADR cases. I don't see that many 5710 fees anymore. But okay, as a so judge, uh, just to interject, 
if you're a certified specialist, which you can become after five years of practicing, you're going to award more than say an attorney who's been doing this for 25, 30 years, but is not a certified specialist on his face. Am I correct? No, not really. What I'm saying is though, per se, if you're a specialist or okay, let's say specialist slash super experienced attorney, if you petition for 450, I'll give you 450. However, if you're somebody who's been in the business for a year or two and defendants object, maybe I will give you less. However, if you're a contract, if you're an attorney who's using a contract attorney, I may only, you know, you're probably only paying this contract attorney 60 bucks an hour, maybe 80, maybe a hundred. Why would I give you four or four hundred and fifty dollars an hour for somebody you're hiring for 80 or a hundred dollars an hour? And, and it's no benefit to your client. You have some some guy who's sitting there. Maybe he's falling asleep. Maybe he's serving the internet. Maybe he's actually paying attention. Um, <laughs> well, hopefully he's paying attention. I mean, I think we've all heard these stories about contract attorneys that literally fall asleep during the depot. But it, it leads us to another interesting point. Uh, during the past four months, during the COVID-19, travel time has been cut down a lot. And a lot of attorneys are doing their depots in their office. So arguably not entitled to travel time, but let's talk before COVID. Is there a reasonable travel time or can an applicant in Santa Barbara uh, legitimately travel to a defense attorney's office in Riverside and bill six hours for travel? Well, if the defendants, if the applicant's attorney has an office in Santa Barbara and the defendants. Now, let let me back up a second. When I was still doing defense, we decided it was much better to hold uh, applicant depositions at the defendant's office. That way, if there was a no-show, at least I could be sitting at my desk doing some work. Whereas if I traveled to the applicant's office and the client didn't show up, I'd waste it. I would have wasted half a day. Be that as it may, if my office is in Santa Barbara and you want my client's deposition at your office in Riverside, yes, you should reasonably pay for my travel time to and from Riverside. You know, uh, if you're a multi-office firm, you probably have an office in uh, the West Valley or Van Nuys or maybe even Ventura or Santa Barbara County. So basically, if you want me to schlep to Riverside, you really legitimately need to pay me to schlep to Riverside. All right. Well, what's uh, remaining on 5710 fees? Okay, suppose we have a hearing rep, okay? Again, it's like an attorney using a contract a contract attorney. You're, you're paying somebody a heck of a lot less. Your client is not getting the same amount of, of, of uh, benefits. So hearing reps, you know, again, I, I've been off the bench for eight years. I don't see hearing reps in, in ADR. When I was on the bench, I would normally give hearing reps 75 bucks an hour. One firm had an attorney, had a hearing rep, who was a, an attorney admitted in Louisiana. I gave that guy $100 an hour. And what was the normal attorney fee at that time? Uh, I'm going to guess uh, 350 to 400 Yeah, interesting, Judge. I don't uh, know if you're familiar with the 99-cent store case. Uh, I am certainly familiar with that because I'm a hearing rep. I, and at the t- it was it was a hearing rep that appeared at uh, on behalf of applicant at the deposition. They had billed the full. I think it was one seventy five, and this went up to the uh, court of appeal, and they awarded this hearing rep because of his twenty plus years of experience two thirds of the going attorney rate. Now, again, this is not just a hearing rep who has one day's experience. Uh This guy had like 20 years of experience. So the Court of Appeal awarded him two thirds of the going attorney rate. And again, that's the 99 cent store case. Now, that's reasonable. If someone like you or Mr. Zyma appeared, you know, you're not you're not the average hearing rep. You've been doing this for umpteen years. And Zyma would never appear because he goes into his cave, locks it up and closes the windows and makes loves to documents. But yes, I I'm do. I'm a cave appear. dweller. Yeah, he's, I'm but a yes, dweller. yes, I do. <laughs> now, my first year or so after I left the bench, I was doing depositions for a couple of applicant firms who shall remain nameless, 
one out, you know, and they were paying me more as, as, you know, retired judge than they would pay a normal contract attorney. And I actually paid attention and I gave them very detailed hearing reports. I, and I would make objections to the point where I actually got thrown out of a couple of defendants' offices. Is interesting enough, one guy who threw me out of his office because my client was dumb as a rock and I kept trying to help him out. About three months later, it appeared in front of me on an ADR case. He was not quite as arrogant. So, uh, but this firm, one of the firms, was billing me at $600 an hour. And I told them to stop that. You're making me look like a schmuck. So anyhow, but I, st- I don't do depositions anymore. You know, uh, I love injured workers. I just don't want to represent them. I, I completely understand. My name is Steve Appel. You're dialed into Work Comp Matters. We've got retired judge, 35 years uh, in workers' comp, uh, 20 years on the bench, retired judge Howard Goodman. We're talking about attorney fees, um, and we're going to have a, a short break by uh, our Zoom 5 and 10 uh, in a couple of minutes, and then when we come back, uh, Judge, I want to talk to you about attorney fees on settlements and trials, if we're finished up with 5710. No, I think that would be the next good segue. Yeah, I totally yeah, agree with you. Okay. Um, I uh, appeared at my first video WCAB trial today, as I announced on the show last week, uh, video trials uh, were going to start this past Monday. And uh, the judge that I appeared before and the court reporter and myself, this was our first uh, video trial. And we had uh, my client, the injured worker in my office, uh, presumably the, the judge was in his office and the defense attorney was in his office and it went relatively smoothly. Um, I had a little problem with my laptop at first where we could not get the sound going. So what happened was the court reporter uh, sent me uh, another phone number. And so we had my video on where we could, uh, we had the video on with the sound down on my computer. And then we had the sound going through the phone and relatively speaking, it went pretty smoothly. And um, I, you know, I am I was very impressed. Uh, not a problem. Um, let's see. I know we want to go to fees. Uh, well, Judge, any anything else that you prepared to talk about except for attorney fees at trial and uh, and uh, uh, settlements? I know how how about uh, how about attorney fees awarded to the other side for unreasonable conduct if if that makes sense no i i I understand we you know we have some some uh, applicant attorneys who uh who just don't know what's going on we have some defendant uh, defense attorneys uh you know you have well with with defendants you know they're subject to 5814.5 but yeah if somebody you know 5813 5814 you know unreasonable delay frivolous and delaying tactics you know, uh, and sometimes they become quite obvious. And yeah, you know, your time is worth something. As an attorney, whether you're an applicant or defense attorney, other than your expertise, the only thing you have to sell is your time. And when people waste your time, uh, you're entitled to be compensated. Now, that's an interesting point, and, and I absolutely agree. But let's talk about the amount. We we're talking about contract attorneys. Hypothetically, let's say that you have a defense firm and you were talking earlier that the average applicant attorney fee these days, anywhere from 350 to 500, 550. If I'm not mistaken, the average defense attorney, uh, the fee is going to be between 150 to $200. However, if you've got a five-year attorney that's an employee of the firm, Hypothetically, even though the firm bills him out at like maybe 150 to 200, he might only be making half that amount uh, in his salary. Does that really matter? In other words, is it the usual and customary? And then part two to the question, and then we'll go to the break. We got a couple minutes. Is there any problem with the average applicant attorney fee, 350 to 550, and the average defense attorney fee? 150 to 200 is is there any problem with that 
No, because the applicants are working on a contingency basis. In other words, if, if I catch the big ambulance after you know five hours of work, I make may make two million dollars an hour. However, defendants are operating. Uh, you know, they're doing bulk billing. They are you know billing you know umpteen hours a day. You know, theoretically, no more than eight hours a day, of course, because you know we don't we don't do anything. Theoretically, like yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you know they're you know they're, they're not going to charge their clients. Uh, three, four, five hundred dollars an hour because they're you know they're doing volume, so the clients are getting a volume discount. So you no, know, that's the way it's always been. Applicants, yeah. attorneys, they're not making four hundred dollars an hour, eight hours a day, five days a week. It's they're a not getting paid for every little thing they do. Exactly, exactly. And there you have it. Uh, my name's Steve Appel. You're dialed into Work Comp Matters. It's Hump Day. We've got Ask the Judge, retired judge. Howard Goodman, uh, 35 years in workers' comp, 20 years on the bench. But now it's time for the 10 and 5 Zoom news. Mike and John, you got hopefully up to 10 stories in five minutes. Take it away. And I got the clock. Here we go. The coronavirus pandemic in California is stabilizing, uh, really, and showing other signs of improvement, the state's top health official said Tuesday. Statewide, cases and hospitalizations are trending downward overall, said Health and Human Services Secretary Dr. Mark Gailey, G-H-A-L-Y. Quote, the state picture is stabilizing and coming down some, end quote, he said. The alleged slowing COVID-19 outbreak has California weighing what next reopening will look like. John? Half of all detainees at Bakersfield ICE facility have tested positive for COVID-19. Half of the men locked up at a for-profit detention center, editorial note, they should be illegal, in Bakersfield have been confirmed with COVID-19 after a federal judge ordered U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement to test all detainees at least weekly at the facility. The rapidly growing outbreak at the Mesa Verde ICE Processing Center now includes six detainees, up from 10 confirmed cases as of early last week, according to court documents submitted Monday by federal authorities. Currently, 106 men are being held at Mesa Verde, which has 400 beds. Mike. A series of fast-moving fires in the Bay Area and elsewhere in Northern California, many caused by intense lightning storms, exploded overnight, burning homes, and causing thousands to flee. The fires stretched from wine country to the Santa Cruz Mountains, moving with ferocious speed amid an intense heat wave that also has brought rolling blackouts. Smoke from the fires has caused terrible air quality across the region. Cal Fire issued evacuation orders for communities in the Santa Cruz Mountains from Loma Mar to Boulder Creek overnight because of wildfires. The map of the affected area was expanded into the early hours of Wednesday with the addition of Bonnie Doon and Swanton Road John. This one is for Steve. Citing pandemic rules, LAPD refers three party houses for potential utility cuts. Los Angeles is considering cutting power to at least three houses for violating coronavirus related rules against social gatherings, according to police and city officials. One is a Hollywood home linked to a social media star who allegedly threw a birthday party with many guests. LAPD officers issued citations for noisy gatherings at 13 different homes this past weekend, warning the hosts that they could have their utilities cut, including water and power, if they continue to host parties there. The host of one party in the city's central division refused to heed the initial warning, received a follow-up notice the same night, the address, which police said they could not provide, was forwarded to L.A. Mayor Eric Garcetti's office for a potential utility shutoff. Mike. Sacramento County health officials on Tuesday ordered Capital Christian School to stop on-campus instruction, saying the school was violating state and local coronavirus orders by claiming to be a daycare center. Under emergency orders, the GAV sac orders by the GAP, Sacramento County schools are not yet allowed to open for in-class learning. Child care centers are, however, allowed to be open with restrictions. John. Here's a non-coronavirus a non article. West Nile virus activity rampant in California 
wave speeds up mosquito breeding. The leader of the Sacramento Yolo Mosquito and Vector Control District warned local residents that West Nile virus is intensifying after receiving word earlier in the day that 20 mosquito samples tested positive for the illness. District Manager Gary Goodman said Monday that many of the samples were collected from Carmichael, Fair Oaks, Arden Arcade, and Orangevale. We are keeping a very close eye on all these locations as we have seen a steady amplification of the virus. It takes just one mosquito bite to change your life. Please be aware that West Nile, West Nile virus can affect anyone. Mike. Yowza, a South Lake Tahoe resident is recovering at home from a case of bubonic plague, public health <laughs> officials announced late Monday. That is the same black death that killed millions of people across Europe in the 1300s. Fortunately, the modern world has something that didn't exist back then, antibiotics, said Dr. Stuart Cohen, Cohen of UC Davis, and these medicines can cure the illness if it's diagnosed in time. John. And uh, that is going to be the end of our news. Uh, Zoom News 5 and 10. Guys, awesome job. And yes, first uh, first diagnosis of uh, bubonic plague in California in five years. And John, thank you for doing that uh, story for me uh, because I, <laughs> you know, Erica Garcetti and all of that stuff. Uh, you're dialed into Work Comp Matters. We're joined by a retired judge, Howard Goodman, 35 years in Work Comp, 20 years on the bench. Before the break, we were talking about 5710 fees. Now we want to get to the ever elusive settlement as well as uh, trial fees. Uh, workers' compensation, of course, state mandated language. Uh, the attorney fee disclosure still says 8 to 12%. Yet, quite frequently, judges award 15%. What's your take, Judge? 15% um, is a reasonable sum. Uh, when I was a judge in Ventura in the 80s, my PJ, for some reason, decided he was going to only award 12%, and that was ridiculous because that was a 25% cut in applicants' attorney fees. You know, 15% on your average c and is, is reasonable. 9 to 12%. And an extraordinary case of, of incompetence, uh, arrogance, stupidity, nonfeasance, malpractice. But 15% um, is, is a reasonable sum. Now, um, now, Judge, I have noticed, and a lot of attorneys that I have spoken to, both defense and applicant, have noticed that since COVID-19, where you can no longer walk through, arguably, to any judge you want, you submit your CNR and it goes into the pool, that we are seeing a lot more fees cut from 15 to 12%. And the reason is that this case is only of average complexity. Now, what I heard you say just a moment ago was if there was extraordinary incompetence, the fee could be lowered to 10 or 8%. But what I'm understanding from the judges is that an average complexity case, or some of these judges, does not deserve 15%. What is your take? I think the average, the, your average complexity does deserve 15%. I think... There are some judges at boards that shall be unnamed who are seeing an influx of cases with no medicals settled for nominal sums at depositions, and they're reducing the fees because they think that the injured worker isn't isn't being properly represented, or there really isn't a case to begin with. So the defend the applicants attorneys are just churning. Again, this is you know maybe this is. COVID related, I don't know, maybe it's the level of practice at certain boards, um, but, you know, but, but that's what I, you know, I've talked to a couple of judges about it and this is, this is their take. I, I had a, a recent case, which I see in ARD, I'm not going to name uh, the judge, uh, but the, my office's fee uh, got docked down from 15 to 12 percent because it was an average complexity case. And, and I'm not going to argue with that. But what I found interesting was 
is that we got the case about a year ago. The offer, well, I'm going to say it, the offer was $10,000. And then throughout the litigation of the case, my office was able to get the offer up and up and up and up, where eventually I settled it for $45,000. My office was subbed in because prior applicant attorney was twisting the injured worker's arm to take the 10 grand. And he said, hell no. I ended up getting 45 grand, which is more, considerably more than my client wanted. So my question is, even if the case admittedly is average com- uh, average complexity, if I get 50% or 100% more than my client wants, does that mitigate the lessening of the fee for average complexity? Definitely. Heck yes. Hell yes. Um, you know, we never really got into, you know, the, for years and years they're talking about cases, average complexity, you know, extreme complexity, less complexity. That doesn't really, you know, enter into it. Um, you know, basically look, look at the medicals. What are the results? You can't, you know, some judges, there was one judge uh, years ago uh, uh, who would base his uh, review of CNRs on, well, when I was an applicant attorney, I could have done better. That's not the standard. You know, is it a reasonable settlement based upon the medicals, based upon the nature of the injury, based upon the, the desire of the applicant? You know, a lot of times the applicant needs money, so maybe they'll take a lesser, you know, unfortunately take a lesser amount, or maybe they want to leave the country, go back to their homeland and, and you know, to get their medical treatment. So, um, in your case, that was ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, And you may or may not be fading out, Judge. I don't know if you're moving around or whatever. But the last thing that I want to talk to you about, we got a few minutes left, is the ever prevalent attorney fee split. Now, retired section judge Mark Kahn, I believe, was the first one in workers comp to come out with what's known as, quote, the formula, close quote. Now, whether or not he got it from PI, whether or not he made it up, I don't know. But the formula essentially says that the attorney that settles the case gets 25 to 33 percent off the top and then all of the attorneys split the remainder pro rata. Now, that is generally a guideline, which I agree with. However, there have been cases and I'm not going to name the attorney. You may have seen uh, the published case last year where there was attorney fee of $1.5 million. It was a $10 million settlement. And one attorney had it for had it for like 14 years. And of course she wanted 80, 90%. And the judge only awarded her 10% of the fee and awarded 85, 90% of the fee that the attorney that had it for one and a half, two years, because presumably the attorney that had it for the longer period of time basically didn't do any of the work. What goes into your mind when deciding how to divide up attorney fees? Well, the con the con formula is a good place to start, but you know, in a, in a case where we have a one point two million dollar fee, I'm going to want I want you know I want briefs from each party. I want petitions. You know, for for that amount, give me a, a rational basis. You know, again, I had a case where you know uh, case dragged on forever. You know, the first attorney had it for three years but the second attorney had it for four years. So basically and the pro rata did, didn't work. So, you know, in a, in a really big case, I want a, a petition from the respective attorneys. Um, you know, that will tell me the, you know, again, you know, the pro rata time doesn't always tell the story. Sometimes it does, um, you know, perhaps like in, in, in the case that you talked about, you, you know, the, the prior attorney could have gotten 10, you got 45. Well, then the, Maybe the prior attorney should get a fee based on on 10 and you get the rest of the fee. But it is the formula is a guideline, but the code and I think can't think of the code right now for awarding attorney fees. It's based on the quality of the work, so to speak. And and, um, I am absolutely glad that you agree with that. Uh, Retired Judge Howard Goodman, 35 years in workers comp, 20 years on the board on the bench. You're available uh, for expert witness, uh, ADR, alternate dispute resolution, mediation, arbitration. Go ahead and give your contact information. And then unfortunately, I got to close the show. Okay. Uh, you can get my f- information on the state bar website, but 
My email is hgeep at earthlink.net. And my cell phone, which I always answer, is 818-522-2603. And I'm very good at what I do. Uh, Absolutely. Very good at what he does. Thank you very much, retired Judge Howard Goodman. Uh, For uh, Uncle Studio, Scott Walton, I wanted to make sure I said it right today. (laughs) Madman Across the Water, John Scalia, my chief of staff, Mike Zyma all the good people back at theworkcompcentral.com and of course A1 Law. My name is Steve Appel. We'll see you again tomorrow at noon for another edition of Work Comp Matters.